A man opens fire on rush hour traffic. A terrorist organization plots to overthrow the government. A member of law enforcement guns down an innocent woman. An armed bank robber strikes again and again. And a man abducts and kills a 17-year-old girl. As violent crime terrorizes the nation, the FBI must stop these criminals before they strike again. In over 100 episodes of the FBI files, we've witnessed criminals not only terrorizing their victims with violence, but plaguing our society with fear. We look to both the experience and the courage of law enforcement to protect us and provide us with the hope that justice can and will prevail. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. In this special episode, we take a closer look at cases previously featured on this series. Our goal is to explore more fully some of the investigative methods and techniques that have made the Federal Bureau of Investigation the premier law enforcement agency in the world. FBI Director Robert S. Mueller. The FBI was originally established to address crime that covered cities, uh, counties, and spread across state lines. Uh, uh, the country needed a federal law enforcement entity to do those investigations. And over the years, as the country has grown and as the world, by the same token, has grown smaller, the FBI's mission has changed to meet uh, the various threats. October 1995. The Shaw family finds itself in the middle of a nightmare. Three masked gunmen have broken into their South Carolina home. Two hold several family members hostage, while the leader forces Amy Shaw to let him into the vault at the bank where she works as a teller. He gets away with $80,000, allowing Amy to remain unharmed. Before leaving, he calls his accomplices to tell them the job is done and that they should flee. Once their captors are gone, the Shaws call the police. Patrolling the neighborhood, police find two young men who they eventually take into custody. Since the gunmen were masked during the crime and left no fingerprints, police cannot tie these men to the scene. The two suspects give statements to the local police in which they deny taking part in the crime, but authorities doubt they are being truthful. FBI agents know they must try to get a confession. They will use interrogation techniques which require special training. Executive Assistant Director for Law Enforcement Services, Grant Ashley. We graduate from a training school knowing a lot, but the real education starts when you get out and start working cases. That's when you learn about people, and you learn to ask questions a certain way, and whether the answer is truthful or not. Special Agent Jerry Jones chooses a suspect and begins the interrogation. Like most agents, he starts by interviewing the suspect about matters that do not pertain to the case at hand. This helps him to choose an appropriate interrogation strategy. It just becomes instinct. While talking to these people, you are able to develop a, uh, a concept of what their greatest fear is, some weakness they may have in their, uh, their past or, or, or their, uh, uh, their family or something of that sort. And in this particular case, it was fear of the death penalty. Knowing that the suspect is unaware that the teller Amy Shaw is now safe, Agent Jones sees his opportunity and decides to exploit it. And what I told him was that my main concern was the safety and well-being of the victim teller. I want her back alive. If your friend killed her, had a third robber killed her, you're going to the lecture chair. They would both have faced the death penalty. 
Jones knows that his choice to use this common technique must be measured. It could backfire. It may strengthen the suspect's resolve not to speak at all. How about come out and tell me the truth? But the agent's plan works. Faced with the prospect of his worst fear coming true, the suspect admits his involvement in the crime and names the lead gunman, Christopher Jaberk. Police quickly arrest Jaberk at his mother's house just over the state line in Georgia. He is convicted on all charges. But Jaberk's crime spree has just begun. Before he can be sentenced, he escapes from jail with a bank robber named Jerome Frierson Bay. Authorities immediately lock down the area. Despite a massive manhunt, they find no sign of the two escapees. Agent Jones knows that when tracking a fugitive, personal information provides important clues as to where the fugitive may go or what he may do next. During several interviews prior to trial, Jones senses a special bond in Jaberk's life, giving him an idea. It became evident to me the only real thing in the world that he cared about was his mother. I was convinced that at some point in time, uh, he would come back to the mother. We established 24-hour surveillance. But Jaberk doesn't show. Agents track numerous bank robberies committed by the two fugitives as they move up the East Coast. In New Jersey, authorities finally locate and apprehend Frierson Bay. Agents are disappointed Jaberk is no longer with them. But Agent Jones has a hunch. I always believed that Jaberk would come back home. The fugitive is located in Atlanta, staying under a false name. Jaberk is arrested without incident, returned to jail, and later sentenced to life in prison. Over the years, you just develop an expertise where you can sense things about a person and his family relationships and things like that. Agent Jones' individual instinct and experience were critical to bringing this case to a close. Sometimes it takes the efforts of an entire team to bring criminals to justice. Seattle, 1992. A gun-wielding man commits a string of daring bank robberies, threatening to kill anyone who gets in his way. Agents named the thief Hollywood for his use of theatrical makeup and disguises in his heists. Over the next three years, the gunman robs 12 banks, taking nearly a million dollars and leaving behind a few clues. To take down this elusive criminal, the Seattle police and the FBI must join several other law enforcement agencies in a unique investigative environment known as a task force. Executive Assistant Director Grant Ashley. We bring together the resources of our state and local partners with the FBI and some of our federal partners so that we can get the unique skills and abilities of these agencies focused on a particular threat to get the maximum results. But local law enforcement and federal agents do not always see eye to eye. FBI officials named Special Agent Ellen Glasser as the supervisor of the Puget Sound Task Force. We had about a dozen different agencies, all of whom came with different missions, different intentions, and it was very interesting because we have different philosophies of how we do things, we have different policies, so it was very challenging to have everybody work together for the common good. Seattle Police Detective Mike Megan is also a member of the task force. I looked at it myself as being a guest in the FBI's house. You know, there's a lot of respect given to them, but there was hurdles to be broken down, you know, preformed opinions or judging a book by its cover. We had to put things aside, such as egos and attitudes, and, and, and who is going to always take the lead, and who is going to be the point man, and, uh, you know, are the officers going to play second fiddle? and we had to, to come to an understanding. The task force cannot expect to accomplish their mission if they cannot work as a team. We had to work on communications. 
between task force members every day. They were very strong-willed people that were on the task force. And my philosophy has always been that if you put relationships first and work on relationships with people working together, then the mission will take care of itself. With this philosophy, Glasser brings cohesion to the group. The task force is now working as one. Together, they determine the pattern and frequency of Hollywood's crimes, so they will be prepared to react quickly the next time he strikes. The effort pays off. On November 27, 1996, Hollywood is the prime suspect in an armed bank robbery. Through the combined efforts of the task force, police locate and corner him in a camper. Tragically, he ends his own life with a single shot to the head. Even though people brought different experiences and different expertise to the task force, they were all able to blend and work extremely effectively together. FBI field agents often receive the glory for solving cases. But the highly skilled technicians at the FBI crime lab in Quantico, Virginia, deserve much of the credit. They are more than scientists in lab coats. They are creative detectives whose tireless work will often decide whether or not a case is resolved. Dr. Dwight Adams is the assistant director in charge of the lab. I knew I wanted to be a part of the FBI laboratory because it is a world-class facility. And you can look in the eyes of any individual in this building and you will see people who are very dedicated to performing at the very highest levels. And our only interest is in providing the truth providing the most accurate, reliable, and unassailable results that we can. January 11th, 1982. California Highway Patrol Officer George Gwaltney calls in a possible suicide off Interstate 15 near Barstow. When backup officers arrive, they find 23-year-old Robin Bishop dead from a single gunshot wound to the head. Police cannot find a gun at the scene, but they do find handcuff marks on the young woman's wrists. Clearly, this was no suicide. This was murder. In 1982, California Highway Patrol Officer George Gwaltney reports the discovery of a suicide victim on the side of the road. But since the victim was shot in the back of the head, Investigators on the scene conclude that it was murder. The victim's driver's license and registration are visible, as if they had been taken out for some reason. To rule out the possibility that a police officer killed the young woman, the lead investigator orders all area officers to hand in their service weapons for ballistics comparisons. One officer fails to do so. George Gwaltney, who insists his gun has been stolen. Gwaltney becomes a suspect when investigators find the dismantled frame of his police-issued 357 in his truck. Someone has removed the barrel, the one piece that through ballistics testing can forensically tie the gun to the bullet that killed Robin Bishop. Police also find a box of ammunition in Gwaltney's bedroom closet it is the same brand of bullet that killed Robin. In late 1982, the state of California charges George Gwaltney with murder, but a deadlock jury results in a mistrial. A second trial in Superior Court also ends in deadlock. Investigators are convinced Gwaltney is guilty, but they can no longer charge him at the state level. They look to federal authorities for help. Special Agent Michael Randolph reviews the case and recognizes that Gwaltney is so cunning, prosecuting him will be difficult, if not impossible. Getting a conviction will take extraordinary tenacity from both the agents in the field and from the specialized examiners at the FBI's crime lab. Executive Assistant Director Grant Ashley. Technology has been a great tool for, for 
what still is the most important aspect for the FBI is the human side. FBI examiner Jim Cadigan from the lab's firearms and tool marks unit tries to find a link between the evidence and the suspect. Normally, he would compare the striations in the murder weapon's barrel to those on the fatal bullet. But the barrel is missing. Cadigan will need to think outside the box to find another way to the truth. He knows that investigators had confiscated vice grips and wrenches when they found the revolver's frame. The question was, could one of these tools have been used to hold the frame while the barrel of the firearm was being removed? Cadigan decides to use a technique known as tool mark analysis. He notices a small impression on the gun frame, then checks each of Gwaltney's tools until he finds a pipe wrench with a broken tooth. And that looked very similar to the mark that was on the frame. So using that as a pivot point, I started making impressions with that tool and comparing those impressions uh, under a microscope, I was able to come to a conclusion that that particular tool was used to the exclusion of any other tool to make the marks that were found on the frame. Although this points to Gwaltney as having removed the barrel of his gun, it is not enough to prove he killed Robin Bishop. Investigators will have a case if they can find a link between the fatal bullet and the box of ammunition from Gwaltney's closet. In an unprecedented move, the lab decides to employ a new technique they've been developing, which matches the molecular content of the bullets. FBI Special Agent Michael Randolph. When a manufacturer of lead like Remington Arms makes a batch of lead, they throw things in much as you would when you're making meatloaf that makes each batch of lead unique. In the FBI's very first nuclear ballistics examination, scientists place a fragment of one of Gwaltney's bullets in a nuclear reactor, where it absorbs neutrons and becomes radioactive. When measured, the radioactivity reveals the precise amount of each element in the lead, an atomic fingerprint. Examiners then repeat the process with a piece of the fatal bullet, and lo and behold, we find approximately 27 rounds that are the exact match as the lead taken from the head of our victim. In January of 1984, George Gwaltney goes on trial, this time in federal court. Gwaltney is found guilty and sentenced to 90 years in prison. 12 years later, George Gwaltney died in prison of a heart attack. Executive Assistant Director for Law Enforcement Services, Grant Ashley. There's the unsung heroes that you never hear of, the people sitting back in the laboratory that make sense of this. This takes an awful lot of time, and it takes extraordinarily talented, patient people. Proving a case using hard scientific evidence is an essential tool of every law enforcement agency. But when authorities have no clear suspects and very little physical evidence, the FBI must rely on one of their most unique and least understood disciplines, profiling. May 31st, 1985. On a lonely road in Lexington, South Carolina, 17-year-old Sherry Faye Smith checks her mailbox before disappearing without a trace. Two days of fruitless searching leads investigators to conclude that she has been abducted. Early the next morning, their fears are realized when the missing girl's family receives a call from the kidnapper. He explains they will eventually get their daughter back and tells them that they will receive a letter later that day. When the letter finally arrives, the family is horrified. Written in Shari's handwriting, the document is entitled last will and testament. In South Carolina, a young woman has been abducted. Her life is on the line, and investigators have no idea who the suspect is. In an effort to identify what sort of man would have kidnapped Shari Fay, investigators call upon FBI profilers at the investigative support unit in Quantico, Virginia. Profilers are veteran agents who receive specialized training in criminology and applied psychology. 
Retired FBI Special Agent John Douglas advanced the art of behavioral profiling for the FBI. For over a decade, he and others conducted interviews with convicted killers, arsonists, rapists, and kidnappers in various prisons around the country. I tapped through that memory of theirs that uh, no one has ever tapped into before when they were perpetrating uh, the crime. It takes time, but once I'm in there, I get tremendous information. Douglas and others cataloged and categorized their findings, creating a statistical database from which profilers can draw inferences about criminals based on patterns of behavior. I'm very much like a, a, a doctorate in medicine, where I'm trying to come up with a diagnosis, and I'm going to rely on the thousands of cases that I've worked. I'm going to rely on the hundreds and hundreds of, of, of interviews of offenders who committed similar types of crimes. When creating a profile, Douglas needs to review all investigative materials, including preliminary police reports and crime scene photographs. You really need to have the, uh, all the information uh, relative to the victim. You have to do a, an analysis, a profile of the victim. You ask yourself the question, why was this victim the victim of this crime? And then you look at the way the crime was, was perpetrated, the low-risk crime or, or high-risk crime. When someone asks for a profile, what they're looking for are physical and behavioral characteristics, which includes age, race, sometimes uh, body typing, uh, educational level, occupational uh, type. Sometimes it may include the right down to the type of vehicle the person will be driving. Uh, may include the overall behavior of the subject, whether or not he's he's very very rigid, obsessive, compulsive on one extreme, to be very very sloppy and careless on the uh, on the other. And so it can include sometimes as many as uh, as a hundred characteristics uh, in the overall profile. Yeah. At the request of South Carolina authorities. Douglas turns his attention to the Sherry Faye Smith case and reviews all the case right, materials. What made the case unique was that uh, we have a, a subject who is communicating with, with the family, which is very, very rare, very, very unusual. I felt good about it because when you have a communique, whether it's a written communique or a verbal communique, you can do an analysis of that and it begins to paint a pretty nice picture of the type of person we should be looking for. It was if he followed a script that was, that was written out beforehand. Here is someone who will be very, very rigid, very, very orderly, uh, very, very tight. After scrutinizing every detail of the abduction, Douglas White generates male. a 22 point profile. The subject is likely a male with a prior criminal record and lives locally. The nature of the criminal beast is that they will perpetrate crimes and they will, as well as dispose of crimes in areas where there's some type of familiarity. Douglas also believes the abductor has feelings of inadequacy and compensates for that through violent actions. He feels like nothing, he feels like a, a nobody. And how can this nobody, this personality, this person who's probably overweight, low self-esteem, doesn't, unattractive, how can he become a somebody? He'll go after victims that there was no chance that he would ever come in contact with someone like, uh, like a Sherry Faye Smith. And so for the first time in their life, they can be, be powerful. Two days after the kidnapper's last communication, he calls the family with specific directions to where they can find their daughter. Listen carefully. Take Highway 378 West to Traffic Circle. Turn left at White Frame Building. Go to Backyard. Six feet beyond, we're waiting. God chose us. Investigators race to the location, hoping to find the young girl alive. When they arrive, their worst fears are confirmed. Sherry Faye Smith is dead. The body, having been exposed to the extreme heat and elements for several days, is so decomposed it makes determining the exact cause and time of death impossible. To the profiler, the detailed directions to Sherry's body, as well as the condition of the crime scene, provides further insight into the suspect's mind. 
He told me that he had been out to that crime scene on several different occasions because he was very specific as to the number of miles, and tens of miles, and number of feet where where she can be uh, found. He also told me that he, he had some criminal sophistication because I believe what he did is he waited for her to go into advanced stages of decomposition, which would make it more difficult for law enforcement to determine cause and method of death. On the evening of Shari's funeral, the killer calls again and asks to speak to her sister, Dawn. Hello? This thing got out of hand, and all I wanted to do was make love to Dawn. I've been watching her for a couple of weeks. To who? In a chilling moment, the killer uses Dawn's name in place of Sherry's. Investigators brace themselves for the possibility that this killer may be turning his murderous obsession towards Dawn. South Carolina investigators are searching for the man who murdered 17-year-old Sherry Faye Smith. FBI profiler John Douglas assists the investigation by providing a profile of the suspect. After two weeks spent underground, the killer resurfaces. In a bold move, he snatches nine-year-old Deborah May Helmet from her front yard in plain view of another child. For profiler John Douglas, the killer's shift to a riskier crime is a sign that he is under duress. The crime does not reflect uh, distress at that time. However, what happens when you start putting it together from experience of other cases, i.e. the Ted Bundy case, kills women at the Kyle Omega house, and then he goes after a young, a young child. He's to totally trying to break down under the stress of being under the scrutiny of, of, of law enforcement, trying to hunt him down. After kidnapping Sherry Faye Smith, the killer had repeatedly called the family. But this time, he remained silent. Douglas must devise a plan to draw him out. He knows that killers will often follow their crimes in the media. So he decides to organize a memorial service that he knows will be reported in the newspapers. He hopes this will rekindle the killer's fascination with Sherry Faye's sister, Dawn. The kidnapper takes the bait and makes a call to Dawn. Then, before hanging up, the killer gives Dawn a series of directions. Okay, listen carefully. Go one north, turn right. Deborah Bay is waiting. God forgive us all. Investigators follow the directions. There, they find the body of nine-year-old Deborah May Helmick. Douglas suspects the killer will likely try to abduct Dawn. Meanwhile, forensic scientists use a process known as electrostatic detection to read invisible indentations on Sherry Faye's last will and testament. The information leads investigators to a suspect, Larry Jean Bell, a local blue-collar worker. Police interview people who know Bell. In learning about him, investigators find that he matches Douglas's profile exactly. Authorities arrest Bell. Forensic evidence and Douglas's profile help convict Bell of both murders. He is executed on October 4th, 1996. In this case, Douglas was instrumental in identifying an unknown killer. Profilers can also confirm suspicions about known suspects. In 1983, Alaska state troopers are investigating the state's first serial killer. Dozens of women, mostly exotic dancers and prostitutes, have disappeared. Many are never seen again, but some turn up in shallow graves with two 23 caliber shell casings nearby. The state troopers have a suspect, a local family man, Robert Hansen. A year earlier, a prostitute had told the local Anchorage police that she had been abducted and tortured by Hansen before she was able to escape. Anchorage police officers interviewed Hansen's friends, confirming his alibi. 
They searched his house and car, but found no evidence and suspended the investigation. Investigators felt that Hansen, who owns a local bakery, was too unlikely a suspect. But when the state troopers learn of the prostitute's report, they believe he may be the serial killer they are searching for. Investigators contact FBI Special Agent John Douglas for help. And this wasn't really to do a profile. Here they have a suspect, so what you do is you do a personality assessment of this, of this individual and some of the circumstances around him to see whether or not this person has the capability, the capacity, the propensity to, for violence. The fact that the killer had murdered so many meant to Douglas that he has the means to function unnoticed in the community, someone who works independently. Since the bodies were recovered in remote areas of wilderness, the killer could possibly be an avid outdoorsman. Hansen fits the profile. He is both a small business owner and a recreational hunter. Since he preyed on prostitutes and exotic dancers, Douglas concludes the killer would have low self-esteem and had probably grown up feeling like an outcast. Hansen was unattractive. His face was all pot-marked, uh, had a speech impediment, which probably caused him a lot of problems as a kid growing up. After reviewing all the case materials, Douglas concludes that Hansen was indeed capable of murder. If investigators are to prove Hansen's guilt, they'll need physical evidence. To obtain a search warrant for Hansen's home, they'll have to convince a judge of what they will find there. You want us to ask a question first? The profiler's role now switches from confirming suspicions about a suspect to helping investigators develop a search warrant. Authorities know they need to look for the gun that left the 223 caliber shell casings found near the bodies. They ask Douglas if there is anything else to list in the warrant. We're dealing here with a serial killer. It starts off as fantasy. And one of the things to keep the fantasy going after the crime is they take some type of a memento. We call them either souvenirs or trophies, something belonging to the victims. It doesn't have to be anything expensive. It could be, be a cheap watch or costume jewelry. And what they'll do is, is that they'll, they'll keep this. They'll not, they're not going to keep this out in open view. They're going to secrete this in, in places within the house, uh, you know, under a crawl space that they have it, or up in the, in the attic under insulation. Douglas helps prosecutors write the affidavit, which swells to 48 pages. A judge approves the warrant. During the search of Hansen's house, investigators find the trophies Douglas suggested would be there, including the business cards of some of the victims. They also find several weapons. Among them is a 223 Ruger rifle. Ballistics testing proves it is the gun that fired the shells found near several of the crime scenes. Confronted with all the evidence, Hansen finally breaks. He confesses to murdering four women and is sentenced to 461 years with no chance of parole. While a profiler provides a psychological picture of a criminal, agents in the field use their instincts, experience, and deductive reasoning to get inside the mind of a suspect to uncover motive. On the morning of January 25, 1993, a lone gunman opens fire in front of CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia, killing two CIA employees and injuring several others. In 1993, a gunman unleashes his fury with an AK-47 outside CIA headquarters, killing two and wounding others in a hail of gunfire. FBI Special Agent Brad Garrett arrives on the scene and attempts to piece together a motive for the attack. The first thing you do when you walk into a crime scene is, what's the obvious? Well, the obvious is this appears to be directed towards the CIA. It might be directed towards the, the individuals that were shot but it was clearly somebody wanted to make a public statement during the rush hour traffic. So that sort of gives you a shell at least to start from. In any case you investigate, you always look for a link between the victim and the subject because if you have a link, it tends to make it a lot easier in solving the case versus strangers who can make crimes against other individuals. But once we started looking at the backgrounds of the individuals that were shot, and we looked at the circumstances as to why they were at that intersection, 
it didn't appear, at least to me, that there probably was a link between those particular individuals being shot and the person that shot them. So we immediately started looking at who uh, within the CIA, in other words, disgruntled employees, present employees, that may have had a relationship with these people that could have uh, retaliated for whatever reason. But after spending some time doing that, there was really nothing in there that jumped at us either. So I said, well, where do we go from here? We well, start looking at the logical things. You have a description of an individual who did this shooting, brought an assault rifle up to shoulder and started shooting down range. And so you're looking for somebody that appears to have a real issue with the CIA. By cross-referencing the killer's physical description with a database of recent purchases of AK-47s, investigators identify a suspect. He is 28-year-old Mir Amal Kanzi, a Pakistani immigrant. Garrett's initial assessment of motive is confirmed during interviews with people who know Kanzi, including his roommate. They revealed that he was becoming enraged by U.S. foreign policy and was planning something sinister against the CIA, White House, or the Israeli embassy. Unfortunately, Kanzi has fled to either Pakistan or Afghanistan. To bring the fugitive back to the United States for trial, Garrett must utilize what is arguably an agent's most important skill, his ability to anticipate obstacles and to devise ways around them. After four and a half years of pursuit, Agent Garrett receives information that Kanzi is hiding in a Pakistani hotel. But when they apprehend him, there is a problem. One of the fears I had when we went in the room and looked at him is that he didn't look like his picture. He gained weight, he had a beard. And so I looked at the other three agents and I said, you know, I'm not sure if this is the right guy. Agent Garrett must be absolutely positive. Without properly identifying the suspect, he cannot bring him back to the United States. I did not want to leave that, that room without being convinced in my own mind that the individual that was handcuffed on the bed was, in effect, Mir Amal Khansi. The only way for Agent Garrett to make a positive ID is through fingerprint analysis typically the job of highly skilled lab specialists who are thousands of miles away in Washington. Fortunately, Agent Garrett had thought ahead. I went to FBI headquarters to the latent fingerprint section and worked with one of the experienced latent fingerprint examiners who actually took the 10 fingerprints of Mr. Kanzi, and we actually studied them over several days and learned all the unique characteristics so that I would be able to identify him uh, by fingerprints once we found him. Now Garrett must put that training to use. He was handcuffed, face down on the bed. And I took a, a fingerprint ink pad and hit his thumb with the ink. Then I took a white piece of paper and then hit his thumb onto the white piece of paper. So then I hit his thumbprint. I got on the floor of the hotel with a flashlight, a magnifying glass, and his prints. It's a match. Thanks to Agent Garrett's foresight, he can now bring a suspected terrorist back to the United States for prosecution. Mir Amal Kanzi is found guilty of murder, malicious shooting, and using a firearm in the commission of a felony. He is sentenced to death and is executed in 2002. Special Agent Brad Garrett's unique training and experience helped him close this case. But sometimes an agent's greatest asset is his ability to adapt to new situations and think on his feet. Executive Assistant Director Grant Ashley. These are people that want to win. They aren't here just to get a paycheck. 1985. In the hills of Arkansas, an army of extremists plot to overthrow the U.S. government. They spread a doctrine of hate, murder, and genocide, launching death raids on churches and synagogues. Federal agents must dismantle this heavily armed militia without igniting a bloody war. The FBI follows a trail to the compound of the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, 
or CSA, a violent group of white supremacists. The compound is heavily fortified, and the men inside are armed with grenades, dozens of automatic weapons, and even a powerful anti-tank rocket. Investigators need to serve arrest and search warrants. But unlike most circumstances where a SWAT team would be utilized, this situation is more delicate. Reports confirm that innocent women and children are inside the compound. With hundreds of lives in the balance, there can be no margin for error. Authorities working the case do not have the expertise or manpower to take on the CSA. And the US Constitution bars the military from aiding in a civil investigation. The FBI decides to send a highly trained tactical group called the Hostage Rescue Team, or HRT, the Bureau's equivalent of the Army's Delta Force. The HRT acts as a counterterrorism unit within the borders of the United States. In 1985, Special Agent Danny Coulson is the commander of the HRT. The HRT basically are assaulters. It's their job to go into a crisis point and neutralize terrorists and rescue hostages. But this was not that type of situation. Uh, these people are very well armed and they were very formidable. And uh, we wanted to avoid a shootout. To serve the arrest and search warrants safely, Coulson needs to adapt to the circumstances. With their traditional method of attack out of the question, they devise a different approach. The very reputation of the FBI was, was dependent upon this case, and we believe that without any doubt the best way to do this was to surreptitiously set a perimeter which would be very dangerous and difficult, but certainly less dangerous and difficult than, than doing an assault on that compound. During the first phase of the operation, reconnaissance teams penetrate the compound's perimeter in the dead of night. Using handheld and airplane-based sensors, they avoid roaming CSA patrols. After 10 days of scouting, an HRT sniper team reports a CSA patrol is about to unwittingly stumble across their position. As team leader, Coulson must make a split-second decision that could affect the lives of hundreds of people. In 1985, the FBI is closing in on the CSA, a right-wing paramilitary organization based in Arkansas. Over 200 agents secretly surround their compound. FBI snipers report a CSA patrol is about to discover them. One, FBI on. hostage rescue team leader Danny Coulson must act quickly. He knows if he makes the wrong move, a bloody war could ensue. His decision is surprisingly bold. I said, you hail them, you yell at them, and tell them you're the FBI, and tell them to go back inside. And uh, everybody kind of looked at me like, well, why don't we grab these two guys? And I didn't want to do that. Coulson's tactic is calculated for maximum effectiveness. I wanted to scare the daylights out of these guys. But I also wanted them to understand that if I gave them a, an order, they had to follow it. I wanted them to get in the habit of following my orders or the orders of my team. And secondly, to, shoot, to show them that we weren't there to hurt them. The sniper alerts the roaming patrol and orders them back inside. They comply. But now the CSA knows the FBI is outside their compound. The standoff begins. Now someone must negotiate the surrender of the CSA's leader. Well, the HRT doesn't have a negotiating element, but they work very closely with the behavioral science group at Quantico. The FBI tries to determine the most effective way to deal with the CSA leader, who they suspect will be unwilling to speak with a negotiator. He would only talk to the HRT commander. It would be commander to commander or general to general. The FBI's policy on negotiations has always been that leaders never negotiate. The leader of the HRT, a, a non-scene commander, never, ever, ever negotiates. Uh, to have the leader negotiates takes away some of your techniques. You can't stall for time. You can't play good guy and bad guy between the negotiator and the, and the commander. Nevertheless, the FBI decides they want Coulson to take on the role of negotiator, since that is their only option. 
Now, I wasn't comfortable with that. Uh, I'm a tactical person. I had been a sniper and I'd been a SWAT team member and a SWAT team leader and trained as an operator. And I was not trained to be a negotiator. And uh, I didn't know that I could pull that off. Uh, I had much more comfortable going in after the guy than trying to talk him out. And, uh, but they were adamant that it had to be done like that. Through his experience in observing negotiations and some quick on-site training, Colson is able to adapt to his new position. The CSA leader makes first contact when he calls the FBI's command post and speaks with Agent Colson. We talked on the phone for a few minutes about things we wanted to do. He offered to me that he'd be allowed to come out because he wanted to personally talk to me and see me. But he also be allowed to go back in, which I agreed to, which was total departure from FBI policy. And uh, we made a quick contact with FBI headquarters because I was getting ready to violate FBI policy by having a, uh, a badly wanted fugitive, a terrorist, in my hands, essentially, and then let him leave. And went up then with the assistant director of the criminal division. In a word, he approved it, said, yes, do it. After a series of face-to-face -face meetings, the CSA leader emerges from the compound. He tells Colson that while he and many of his followers are ready to surrender, there are those who wish to fight, and he cannot control them. And he said to me, I need help. He said, there's a man that, that's our spiritual leader, and I need his advice, and I need, I need his help to convince people that's the thing to do to come out. And I said, who is this? He said, it's Robert Millar. This, again, is, is, is something totally against FBI policy, to bring in a Confederate into a crisis situation, not just to negotiate, but to go inside. That had never been done in the history of the FBI. They'd never allowed that to happen, to allow a third-party individual who was sympathetic to the people we were dealing with to go inside to be a part of the negotiation whether or not they came out. And this is a huge risk, and I thought it was worth taking. Colson gets approval to allow Mr. Millar to negotiate with CSA members. He remains inside the compound for nearly 24 hours. The next morning, day four of the siege, Millar and the CSA leadership finally emerge. They came out and they said, we have an agreement that we will surrender. We will come out and we'll give up our arms and walk out peacefully. As commander of HRT, Colson receives the news with guarded optimism. You're constantly thinking about the worst case scenario. Even good things have to be looked at with, with some suspicion. Was it a diversion to get, to get out the backside and start a firefight? So um, we had to be very careful. Colson gives the leader 15 minutes to gather his people and bring them out. And very shortly after, I get a, a communication from a sniper team that they're coming. They're coming out. The snipers report that they're in uh, civilian attire. There's no camis. There's no battle gear. There's no weapons they can see. Miraculously, the HRT accomplishes its mission without a single shot fired. It was, it was an ending that we had all prayed for and one that we were very fortunate that we had. If not for Agent Colson's quick thinking, and ability to adapt in tense situations, the standoff would likely have had a much bloodier conclusion. Uh, it shows what the FBI can do in a major crisis situation. It shows the number of different disciplines it has at its, its disposal, how they can bring unlimited resources on the focus of a problem. It's a great big machine. It grinds you up uh, if you're a bad guy, and it's what happened here. This wasn't an HRT story. It's an FBI story. We have seen just a few of the many ways in which the FBI works to solve cases. With each new investigative challenge they face, we can rest assured that the Bureau will dedicate itself to doing whatever it takes to protect the American public.